Good morning and welcome to our March uh, Vision Zero meeting. Uh, welcome everybody and thanks for joining us today. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules before we start. If uh, you're not speaking, please uh, mute your mic uh, after each presenter. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions. And we are recording this uh, because it is a public meeting and we'll have the videos at our Vision Zero website. Before I introduce uh, Drew Cox, our new Division Six engineer, just want to give a shout out to the traffic services. Since our last meeting, they've installed four always stop signs uh, here in the county. So uh, I'm a I'm a, a big advocate for always stops and more of an advocate for roundabouts but an always stop is a good start and uh they've installed four at the intersection of metal road and bg road at the intersection of 74 and chicken road at the intersection of mcqueen and shannon roads and uh at the intersection of 301 and powersville road uh, those make a ton of difference, and I appreciate your efforts. I appreciate the state patrol's efforts in helping us monitor monitor those uh, intersections while uh, uh, that work's being done. So thank you guys. Uh, like I said, we've got a uh, we've got a new division engineer, uh, our old division engineer, uh, Greg Burns is now the Eastern Deputy Chief Engineer for the state. Uh, our new Division Six engineer is Drew Cox. Drew's been with the division or been with DOT for 25, 29 years and is the former maintenance engineer for the division. So welcome aboard, uh, Drew. I'll, I'll tell you like I told Greg, I'm fortunate. I'm, I'm, I've got the best folks in the state and I probably said that a little too much because apparently folks started taking me real serious. And the next thing I know, Greg's snatched away from me. So uh, I'll be a little more quieter uh, when I brag on you going forward. Um, great to thank you for that introduction. And and I, I agree with you. I think we're very fortunate with the folks that we have here in Division Six. It's a great group. and. Um, you know, as, as, as Grady said, I've been with DOT for 29 years, but 25 of those years have been here in Division 6, and I've not quite ever been able to bring myself to, to look for other places to go. So it's a great honor to, um, to be able to step into the role of Division Engineer. We've had some really amazing folks that have come before, Greg being the last, and that's evident now with his new role in Raleigh, and he's already been, uh, being very active in that role, which we all expected. But um, anyways, uh, big shoes to fill, but I'm really happy for the opportunity. Grady is great to work with. Um, and we just, uh, you know, I'm from this area. I grew up in Columbus County. Uh, I've always been around this area. I grew up in high school, going to a 1A school. And, you know, we played baseball all over this area, including some of the older schools, I guess, that have closed now in Robinson. We, we were at Magnolia or in Parkton. Uh, you know, we just grew up going to those places, playing ball and having a good time. So it's, it's great to be able to uh, be in a position to, uh, where we can affect, I think, in a positive way, you know, things that are going on from a traffic or highway standpoint um, in and around Robinson County. And uh, the efforts that Grady has been supportive of with Vision Zero, uh, I think, are so important. And there's a lot of things being tried here uh, that are being watched uh, with a lot of detail. Uh, to see what kind of impacts we're, be, we're able to make, uh, hopefully with the idea of maybe sharing some of these things around the state. So Grady mentioned the always stops that are going into place. We've got more of those. Uh, we've got more roundabouts coming to Robinson County. Um, and it's, it's great to see, and we're really hopeful that it's going to make a major difference. And I think the efforts of the entire tax, task force um, and what it's doing to just bring awareness of highway safety, uh, you know, everybody wants to uh, be able to come home in the evening. And so uh, anyways, just applaud the efforts of the tax task force. And I'm really glad to be able to be a part of that 
and support that effort going forward. But again, uh, Grady, thank you for your support and the introduction, and I'll turn it back over over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Drew, and again, welcome aboard. Look forward to working thank with you. you. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Mark Azell. Mark's the director of the Governor's Highway Safety Program. Mark's going to speak about the spring 2021 seatbelt campaign. Good morning, Mark. Morning. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I'm going to try to make sure that I am on uh, webcam. There we go. Great. I wanted to touch base with you today. I've not prepared a PowerPoint because I just wanted to talk to the group and explain a little bit about what uh, is being planned around the annual seatbelt survey. Let me give you some background on the seatbelt survey. Uh, every year, North Carolina is required to submit to NHTSA a survey of seatbelt use as observed in 15 counties across the state. One of the counties is Robson County, and the survey occurs from June 1st to June 15th in these 15 counties. Um, and from that data, we extrapolate a statewide seatbelt use rate. Now, it's just a snapshot, uh, and so it gives you uh, a sense of what that rate is during those first two weeks in June may not give you a totally full picture, but nevertheless, we submit that to NHTSA and that becomes the official seat belt use rate. We have contracted with the good folks at NC State with ITRI to conduct that survey and they will be doing that during this time. The past four years, we've seen in North Carolina our official seat belt use rate decline significantly. Uh, right now, the official seat values rate for 2020 was 87.1%. Uh, in 2017, it was, I believe, 92.7%. So uh, you can see a bit of a decline. Now, 2020 was an odd year. And uh, so we expect that COVID has something to do with it. And frankly, it's not just us. We're seeing this nationally the official seat bell use rates are declining in many other states. But we clearly got to do something about it. So we've got a, a three-pronged approach that I wanted to tell you about. Keep in mind, June 1st through the 15th is when the survey is going to occur. Prior to that, we want to do three things. One, we've got a paid media campaign that we're going to be starting called Local Heroes. And that's going to feature law enforcement officers from specific areas talking about their area and why they enforce seatbelt use laws. Now, in Robson County, we have got a Robson County officer who is in the process this week, in fact, of, of filming that ad. Uh, we have a couple of other counties that we want to, uh, to center on as well. One of those is Mecklenburg County, uh, the largest county in the state. Uh, where we've seen a precipitous decrease in seat belt use rates. So we're going to be shooting those commercials this week, and we expect them to begin uh, in early May. So we've got the paid media piece. The other piece that we've got is we are going to have increased uh, enforcement through the State Highway Patrol in specific counties. Uh, they're going to be working in specific counties, especially toward the end of May, early June, uh, helping get that enforcement message out. We got our Click It or Ticket campaign occurring in May as well. We always do that every year. So this will help augment that. And we want to make sure that that's high visibility and people know about it. So the third piece of this, though, is where I need your help and assistance. We want to also make sure that we speak with media outlets across the county. And I know there may be uh, a fairly small number of them, but I, I expect a number of people listen to them, be that obviously uh, a newspaper through the Robinsonian, but through uh, radio, uh, there may be other local channels that people in Robson County get their information. We're going to need your assistance in one, determining what those channels are, and then two, 
getting um, uh, folks to speak with those channels during the next couple of months about the importance of seatbelt use. We already have a strong campaign in Robson County through the Don't Rob Robinson campaign. So we want to continue to use that. We also have strong activities through the leadership of Grady and this group uh, to deal with seatbelt use rates. For instance, we have uh, the only seatbelt use diversion uh, program in North Carolina, and it's been very successful with Southeastern. So we wanna leverage that to really be able to increase seatbelt use rates across the state. Uh, but in this case, we've got a particular campaign around Robson County. So those are the three prongs. Our hope is to start, as I mentioned, running these uh, ads um, in April, around April as well, reaching out to various uh, media sources, helping spread the word of the importance of seatbelt use uh, rates. And then around May and June, we're gonna see that enhanced uh, high visibility enforcement piece. So those three pieces are gonna build on each other and we hope is going to bring about an increase in our official seatbelt use rate uh, in North Carolina. So Grady, that's, that's what I've got. Uh, we will show you all those ads as soon as they're created. Uh, but at this point, I just wanted to share with you those general plans. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for the help on that. I mean, we really, uh, it's, it's seatbelt use here's an issue we know that and uh so as many ways as we can combat that as many ways as we can uh try to affect that uh we're all better off no question about that any questions for mark before we go to the next presenter next presenter is going to be miss stephanie chavis stephanie's the director of the robinson county emergency management and the county fire marshal. Welcome, Stephanie, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Grady. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with the group today. Um, Ms. Shore reached out to me, and, and I told her I, I was more than glad to try to come up with a presentation for the group today. Um, as Grady has already said, I'm with Emergency Management. I'm the director and the county fire marshal. And we all have, in my line of work, we have a many opportunities to work with so many partners. We have so many partners that we deal with. But today I wanted to speak on those that we deal with as far as the highway, since this is the Vision Zero Task Force Group. Um, and just to let you know some of our involvement in in the highways and, and those people who work the highways. So um, our first slide is the first responders. The way I thought about doing it was just letting you know what some of our the responsibilities of our first responders are and what they do. So upon arriving on a scene of a traffic accident, first responders have a lot, like I say, they have a lot of responsibilities. One of the first things that they do is they're in contact with the Robinson County Communications Center. Now, those are the folks behind the scene that takes the 911 call. They dispatch out the first responders and the first responder on the scene, he or she, um, they, they make contact with the communications center to relay information back to them as to what they're seeing when they get on the scene. Oops. Um, one of the first things that they are asked to do is verify the location. When you're talking to the telecommunicators, they want you to verify. Yes, when the 911 call came in, it may have been someone driving down the road and they're on a mobile. By the time they call 911, it gets into the 911 center here. They may be at a different location. It may not be exactly where the accident occurred or whatever they're reporting. So when the responders get on scene, it's important that they relay the exact uh, location of the incident to the communication center in the event that other responding units have to find an alternate route. Um, one thing I wanted to point out in this slide is 
the importance of road signs. And I know DOT, the state knows all about this, but it is very important to us because when when we're dispatched out to something, that's what we look for. We look for road signs. You know, maybe as I've got the example here, I-95 southbound lane with mile marker 10, that is very helpful to us. And um, so we appreciate those signs. One of the things that I ask the first responders to do is they respond to calls in their area or in within their districts is I ask them if you see stop signs that are down please call it and report it if road signs um, as far as road name signs if those are down report them to my office and we get in touch with the proper people so that at all times we have signage on the roads because we feel like that plays an important part in safety as well like i say stop signs speed limit signs road names um it's it's helpful to the citizens as well as our first responders part of their uh same size up the second part of that is the vehicles. Now, when they when they arrive on the scene, they look at the vehicles and it may be a personal owned vehicle, it may be a transfer truck. If it's a transfer truck, then they've got to realize, okay, what's on those placards? And the importance of those placards is that helps us know what those vehicles are hauling, how we're going to respond. If it's chemicals, then they need to look at their emergency response books, what type of, um, reactions to these chemicals have to water what kind of effect is it going to have um as far as the first responders what type of equipment do they need to put on do they need to be upwind uh how far do they need to be away so um seeing commercial vehicles on the highway it's very important that they have those placards in the event of an accident where we know how to deal with that situation then their third scene size up is the injured persons. How many people's involved? Um, are they injured? Is it minor injuries? Is it major? What are the extents of those injuries? Is extrication needed? Are these people um, trapped inside the car? Do they need to be cut out? How many EMS units are needed? It could be if, if someone's been thrown from the car or if it's very severe, air care may be needed so then first responders have to set up a landing zone that location has to be identified and a lot of times they will use the highway um, they have to look at things like where are the power lines can the helicopter land here um, because they want to get that helicopter as close to the scene of that accident as possible so then their their fourth thing to do is classify the incident is this major minor intermediate and as you see on this slide we i have minutes or hours or something major will last for hours we've had accidents that uh some of you probably are aware of the accident that happened on 995 years ago where i think there was five vehicles a couple of tractor trailers um that was an all-day event we were there until maybe 11 o'clock that night um that was a major accident your minor stuff little fender benders um you may be on the scene less than 60 minutes but um like i say and hopefully with what's going on with all the work that vision zero the task force is doing we're hoping that you know the only thing we'll have in the future is minor uh, and i know that's what you're shooting for is just those little minor fender benders point operations we work with tow companies uh, we partner with them. We have to call them out. Um, okay, depending on the kind of incident, like minor, it might be that you can call a rollback, or you might need um, for f the flatbed towing. It may be wheel lifting towing. Um, if you have something major, then you're going to need something heavy duty. And um, so we work with the tow companies. It's important to know what they need to call for. And so, like I say, it's important to know what you're dealing with so that you know what to ask for. Now, what I'd like to do is to try to tie all this together. I, I've given you the scene size of what they do when they arrive on the scene. So I thought the best way to do that is give you a scenario. And the information that I'm giving you here, I didn't give you the location or date or anything. Um, 
but this is an actual event that I will use for scenario here. So we have an accident, communications dispatches out first responders to a vehicle accident. It's um, involving a personal owned vehicle and a tractor trailer. At the time, I'm not sure if I don't recall, but um, if the cars, the vehicles were on fire at that time, or if they were on fire, if the first responder called that in after they got on the scene. But we were notified that both vehicles were on fire, the tractor trailer and the personal vehicle. Once um, they establish an incident commander, which is normally the fire chief, because most of the time fire chiefs of the fire departments are the first on the scene. So once the fire chief gets on the scene, he becomes the incident commander. He realized that he needed additional fire departments. So there's one partner. Then we needed EMS and local rescue squads. That's more partners. Of course, we're gonna call for North Carolina Highway Patrol because they're gonna investigate the incident or the scene. Uh, sometimes Robinson County Sheriff's Office is involved. They come and they assist with traffic control. Then we have DOT to come in. DOT, we may request that they bring message boards or barricades to assist with detouring traffic. Um, and the message boards that they have over like 95, those are very helpful because if it's an accident we have on 95, which like I say, we had one a few years back um, where we had to shut down the southbound lane of 95. So those messages that go across on the boards um, that are over the interstate are very helpful um, with helping with accidents. Um, so then, that we had to call the power company because the power pole had been snipped. Uh, we had power lines down, so they had to be notified. CSX was also notified because we had to shut, there was a railroad near this area, um, didn't go exactly through it, but it was close enough that it was in the affected area. And we um, had to shut down the railroad due to an evacuation order that I uh, put into place. So emergency management, once they did the scene size up, we knew what we were working with. We had all agencies on scene. These agencies, EMS, Highway Patrol, the Sheriff's Office, DOT, Power Company. Um, once everybody's putting their heads together, they're talking, and then we know, okay, we need the regional response team, which is the hazmat team out of Fayetteville. What, in order to get them to come into our county, I have to call the state emergency management. I have to give them a rundown of what's going on in our county. And um, once I do that, then the mission has to be approved by Director Sprayberry. So with this situation, I requested the regional response team out of Fable. They were um, approved by Director Sprayberry. They normally have a response time of about an hour. So everyone was still working at the scene, regional response team arrives and they start working with hazmat. Um, that was due to the chemicals that were on the transfer truck. Now the confusion here was when the transfer truck was burning and this is something that we are going to try to work on and, and find out what we need to do to get this in place. But when the transfer truck was burning, it was impossible to see the placard. So our question was, it, was there anything on, on the truck? Were they carrying anything? Was it empty? So then when the responders found some, I think they found some paperwork or somehow we found out the route that the truck had been making that day. And I called the last known place that the truck had been to find out if they could tell me what was on that truck when it left their business. And they were able to tell me what was on there. So then that's how we found out um, that there were chemicals and that's how we made the decision that we needed the re re regional response team out of Fayetteville. We also partnered with the hospital. We were involved with them. I had to call them, tell them what we were dealing with, told them that we may possibly have some um, first responders. We may have, uh, because then I had to call the power company back and tell them what their folks had been exposed to so that they could go to the hospital and um, go through decon and be checked out. 
So that just gives you a rundown of what we do with the highway, with those partners who are involved with the highway. And there's so many other things that we, we do. You know, during storms, we work with DOT. We're trying to make sure that the highways are clear uh, so that emergency vehicles will have access to get where they need to go because that's important is keeping the highways clear. Like I say, we're, we're always aware of the roadways. If there's damage that needs to be reported, we ask that they report that. Like I say, road signage, they, they're they um, real diligent about paying attention to that stuff and reporting it as well to DOT. So we try to partner. Um, we try to be a good steward and partnership with these folks. Um, and I just wanted to, like I say, bring it all together and let everyone know a little bit about what we do. This just uh, kind of, it actually only scratches the surface on what we do in a day's time. But I, I'd i like to use quotes and I'd like to end with this quote, that individual commitment to a group effort, that is what makes a team work, a company work, a society work, a civilization work. And that's the way I see this. We are all different agencies, but at some point in time, we have to work together. And if we don't work together, then the team doesn't work. And then it affects our society and our civilization. But I'm thankful that we do have that partnership. And, and that's something that um, I push really hard is to have those partnerships with these people because we all need each other in order to make Robinson County a safer place. Thank you, Steph. That's a nice way of kind of tying everything together and letting us all know there's a lot of boots on the ground when there comes, uh, especially a major accident, a lot of partners that have to work together to um, for the common good of all of us. So thank you for tying all that up together for us. Anyone have any questions for Steph before we move on to the next speaker? Again, thanks, Steph. Our next speaker is Lieutenant Alan Carlisle, who is the Director of Professional Standards and Assistant Training with the Law Enforcement Division of NC Wildlife Resources Commission. And I'll tell you, Alan, uh, you, you might have probably the best picture I've seen in a long time uh, <laughs> of, of uh, any scenery. So uh, welcome and uh, look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody here today. Uh, I'm going to try to tie in what wildlife officers do on a daily basis with the uh, Vision Zero principles. Uh, and hopefully it will be a direct correlation and everybody will understand a little more what we do on a day to day basis. Uh, to start with, this is a photograph of one of our officers on Lake Tillery, which is not far from you. And the reason I show this is a lot of our officers are coming in contact with folks from your region on that lake now. For some reason, they are starting to migrate to that location and spend a lot of the summers, whether it be boating, skiing, fishing, any type of activity on the water. We're starting to see that more from, from the Robinson, uh, Scotland, Hope County areas. A lot of those citizens are migrating to that area just for that recreation. So. That was the reason I sort of put that in there. But as you can see, our slogan there, uh, law enforcement off the pavement, that is exactly what we do most of the time. Not always, but most of the time. Let's see if I can get it to advance for me. There we go. All right, as you can see, the law enforcement division has a mission. Um, and our mission is to conserve wildlife resources, promote safe, responsible boating, and to provide public safety. And these are in no particular order. Uh, that is definitely not the priority order. Uh, that is just how we have them listed um, through our mission statement. The next one shows our districts. And the reason I show you this, I want you to see that we are broke up into nine districts. And the Robinson County area is in district four, right there at the bottom of the four. The, the entire blue area there is district four. Um, in that area, we have one captain, we have one lieutenant, four sergeants, and 16 wildlife officers. Now, a lot of people say 16 wildlife officers, that's a lot. But if you look at that area, that geographic region, that is a lot of area to cover for just 16 wildlife officers. 
So we are spread out very thin, but we do still try to make a very serious impact in what we do. This is just to show you um, the difference in area we have in the state and some of the different things we work. Um, there's a vast difference from east to west. And the reason I show you this is just like the bear there. You know, we have bear hunting in the east, we have bear hunting in the west, but they to are totally different how our officers have to work it and how the people are in those regions and how they hunt those bear in, in those different regions. The second one there on the top right is the Venus flytrap. That is uh, indigenous to your area. Uh, District 4 is where that is located. And that is a threatened species. And that is plant protection is one of our priorities. That plant is actually poached uh, probably second most in the state, only to ginseng in the West. So that, that is a multi-million dollar industry plant poaching is in the state of North Carolina. So we, we have a lot to do and we have a lot of different things to do. The next one is these are the approaches we like to take in, in our law enforcement, uh, the proactive um, law enforcement approach and then quality education. We differ a little bit than, than a lot of other law enforcement because we actually get to teach certain education like hunter safety and boating safety. So I'll, I'll break those down just a little bit right quick. The proactive side of it, we like to get out and be seen. This is URA National Forest. This is where um, a lot of your ATV, UTV and motorcycles are. We like to get out in those areas and be seen, just be seen. Um, instead of just always writing tickets, we like to be seen and maybe encourage folks just to do the right thing without us having to take the, the law enforcement side of it and, and take um, citations or fines or whatever the case may be. The next one is just encountering the sportsmen and women of the state, whether they're on public land, private land, a lot of folks don't realize it, but the Wildlife Commission actually manages 2 million acres of public game lands across this state. Um, and we have a lot in your region, and therefore that's a lot of contacts made. It can be a lot of positive contacts made. So that, that's one approach we do like to use. The next one is we wanna be seen in this scenario right here. Many of our lakes across the state, this is what we're seeing more and more of. This is what we call party cove or a party area. And when you, you get this many people uh, in a location gathered together, I assure you there's that much alcohol in that area also. And this directly relates to the principles for Vision Zero. We like to attack um, these issues, hopefully before they become an issue, but sometimes the only way to stop it is to catch the folks. So our ultimate goal is to stop it, whether it be prior to that action being taken or actually having to lay hands on folks and arrest them for uh, operating a motorboat while impaired. But we are running into this more and more. And this next one shows you an aerial of Party Cove on Lake Norman. This gives you an idea of what we deal with in the summertime on Lake Norman. And sometimes it gets very chaotic. But what we try to do is target these locations with marked patrol boats, many officers, and we wanna be seen. That's the proactive side of it of, if it makes one person decide, you know what, I might ought to call somebody to come get in my boat and drive me home. Well, that, that's a success. That's the success we're looking for. Uh, and again, we all know that's not always the case, but that's our goal. The next one, um, I think it skipped one on, there we go, okay. The next thing we do is the, uh, on the emergency management side, we are usually called to most of these natural disasters. And again, the bottom left, that shows us mostly to the west, not always, um, but because we um, work out of four wheel drive vehicles, we're usually called upon uh, to patrol certain roads, certain areas when these winter storms hit, because we all know the highway patrol is inundated with wrecks. And that's about all they have time to deal with. So we are able to get out there and assist stranded motorists or maybe take care of somebody that's broke down, that's in a cold vehicle with kids, whatever the case may be, but that is something we're called upon to do. And the second one uh, everyone here are, are, is very familiar with uh, is the hurricane season. And of course we have four wheel drive vehicles, but we also have lots of boats and the law enforcement manpower. So therefore we are called upon in that situation also, and we're able to get out and assist the public, assist merchant management, fire departments, uh, swift water rescue, all those things uh, we can tie into directly and assist with. The education side of it, we have a three-prong education side that we try uh, to use to our advantage. 
and also for public safety issues. The first one there is the public safety um, announcements, the PSAs. We like to do as many of those as possible. This year, we we're on a campaign. We're going to do three of those, and we're going to target during the summer, we're going to target the holiday weekends, Memorial Day weekend, July 4th, and also uh, Labor Day weekend. So we will try to get those out statewide uh, to try to head off some issues before they become issues and hopefully save some lives and, and maybe some serious injuries from occurring. Um, the second one on the right, top right, that is a classroom setting where an officer is actually teaching a boater ed course which is required for most folks to have to be able to operate a boat on the waters of the state. But that gives us um, a little unique perspective that a lot of other officers don't get across the state. Where we get to see these folks, it's a sort of a personal situation where we get to see them face to face and actually educate them on regulations, laws, and safety. And then the bottom one, uh, this one has become popular in the last couple of years. We have officers set up what's called pre-launch inspections. These are free of charge. We do them on public boat access areas. And what we do is we try to encounter these folks prior to them launching their boat on the water. And this, this occurs statewide. And what we do is we approach those folks and ask them, would you like for us to do a, a safety examination of your boat free of charge? Uh, if we encounter any type of uh, deficiency in your boat or safety equipment, there'll be no uh, legal recourse. So there's no citations issued, anything like that. It gives them a chance to fix the issue prior to getting on the water. So if they're short life jackets, we don't want them to find out they're short life jackets when they're in a boating incident and the boat's going down. We do a whole lot rather than find that out on dry land, fix it, then go out and enjoy the day. So that, that's another aspect we are, we are reaching out to the public for and uh, trying to reach as many people as possible with that. The next thing I wanna talk about is our targeted enforcement campaigns. Now this ties directly with Vision Zero. We have a campaign that we do every year with the highway patrol on the road, on the water, don't drink and drive. This has been a pretty big campaign um, and it's been very successful. The second one is Operation Dry Water. This is done through NASBLA, the National Association of State Boating Law Administrators. And this, the way I like to correlate NASBLA is NHTSA is on the highway like NASBLA is on the water. So that gives you an idea of what they do. Uh, but this is a nationwide campaign to stop boating while impaired has been very successful and our agency has been very successful with this campaign. This next one shows you our poster from last year. This was our on the road, on the water, don't drink and drive 2020 campaign poster. Um, one of the photographers for our wildlife magazine actually put this together. As you can see, the aircraft is the Wildlife Commission air aircraft, the plane. The helicopter is the Highway Patrol helicopter, and then you see one of the ghost marked uh, Highway Patrol cars, and then two of their motorcycles. And then there's our marked boat with one of our new marked uh, trucks. So that made a great poster. It has been put out uh, widely throughout the state, and we, we hope it has a positive impact. The next one is our boating while impaired numbers. Just to give you an idea, um, North Carolina does pretty well when it comes to nationwide. Uh, in 2020, there were 268 people in North Carolina arrested for boating while impaired. Uh, in 2019, there was 215, and in 2018, there was 192. And if you look to the right there, you will see our incidents. They are not accidents, they are incidences. Um, we do not see uh, someone getting behind the wheel of a boat and crashing into someone after consuming alcohol or drugs as an accident. No such thing, that is an incident, then it turns into a crime scene. But as you can see there, our fatals, we had in 2020, we had 20 fatals. We had eight alcohol related fatals, almost half. That is a big number and that, that is very discouraging to us. However, you know, we're, we're making an impact just because of the number of people we're removing from the waterways while they're operating uh, while impaired. So that tells us we're doing something, but are we doing enough? Um, we're always open to suggestions. If anybody has suggestions, we're always open to try something new. If it saves one life, it was successful. So that's what the approach we're taking now. This picture right here is very heartbreaking. Uh, the reason I show you this is this had great impact on our state. The two pictures on the left was uh, in 2015 on Lake Norman. Cheyenne Marshall was this young lady's name. She was 17 years old. She was a rising senior in high school. She was run over by an impaired boat operator. She was on a kneeboard, 
then pulled behind a ski boat. When the boat cut between her and the boat pulling her and ran directly over top of her. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, it, it did kill her. And uh, the one good thing that came out of this was Cheyenne's Law. It was signed in 2016 by Governor McCrory at the time. It was signed into law. And what this did was it aligned the boating laws with the driving laws. Chapter 75A is the boating laws. Chapter 20 is the motor vehicle laws. It aligned those laws directly word for word. So instead of where it said vehicle, it said motorboat or vessel. So that changed is the only thing it changed. Everything else is identical. So now when someone commits those crimes, those uh, fines, the penalties are very steep. The fellow that killed this young lady got 60 days in jail and five years probation. Had he committed that crime today, he would be looking at more than 10 years in prison because of Cheyenne's law. So it's, it's very tragic, very unfortunate, but I hate to say this, but really a lot of times it takes the death of someone to get people to take a closer look at what needs to be changed. And it's very unfortunate. As you can see, beautiful young lady there lost her life because of this. Uh, on the right, the top one is another fatality we had on Lake Norman. And then the, the bottom right is one that happened on Baden Lake, which is one of the lakes that the folks, the citizens in your area uh, frequently uh, uh, venture out on. This was a double fatality where a boat ran over that pontoon and killed a uh, expecting mother and, their, and a child, a small child. So these happen every year, unfortunately. Um, we want to reduce them and completely stop them. And again, that goes right along with Vision Zero. There we go. And uh, to give you an idea of how serious Wildlife Commission takes boating while impaired, as you can see here, this is Major Ben Meyer out of Raleigh, and he um, attended the NASBLA meeting where they award uh, Operation Drywater Awards. They have three awards. They have a large category, medium category, and small category. If you have more than 150 officers, you're in the large category. And for the previous four years, North Carolina has won that award for the most boating while impaired charges in the state. So we are trying to do our part. But again, I'm sure you're sitting there asking, well, what does that really have to do with Vision Zero? Well, believe it or not, wildlife officers encounter driving while impaired quite frequently. And some of the places we do that is our boat access areas, fishing access areas, while we're patrolling game lands, that 2 million acres that we have, um, working hunting activities, whether it's private property, public property, working bank fishing, because think about this. A lot of people like to pull the car on the side of the road, walk down the bank, start fishing on a river, a creek, and what do they have with them? Unfortunately, most of the time, it's a 12 pack of beer in a cooler. So what are they gonna do after they consume that 12 pack and they fish for half the day? They're gonna get behind the wheel and drive either to home or go get some more beer. So we do run into that quite frequently. And the other thing we run into is drug driving. And that particularly ties to our plant po poaching. Um, on state, federal, and private properties. A lot of these folks, not all, um, but a lot of these folks are trading those for drugs. And we do see drug use a uh, tremendous amount of time dealing with this. And a lot of times they're operating a vehicle and they are impaired. There we go. And this is what happens when someone is impaired and decided to drive on a boat access area. They thought that was a road and decided to drive right on down the dock. Um, so yes, this young lady was impaired and arrested for driving while impaired. The drug side of it, uh, we run in this a lot because where we are, we're out in places that people think they're not gonna encounter other people. Well, that's where we work and that's where we encounter these folks. Uh, out of these four pictures, three of these people were uh, arrested for driving while impaired. Uh, it was drug driving and a, um, an evaluation was done the middle one was somebody decided to go shoot their heroin up on our uh, game lands. And unfortunately for them, they met us. Fortunately for us, we met them before they got back out on the highway and drove back home. So hopefully we saved someone there. Uh, the drug recognition uh, program, some folks are familiar with it, some are not. Um, drug recognition is nationwide and you are certified nationwide if you're a certified drug, rec drug recognition expert. Um, there are, I think there's 200, I'm sorry, there's 184, D, we refer to them as DREs across the state right now. 
and North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission has eight of those. Uh, and to give you an idea of what we do as wildlife officers, in 2019, wildlife officers conducted 77 drug evaluations for driving while impaired. These were mainly for other agencies. Uh, some were for our officers, but most were for other agencies, whether it was a local department, a sheriff's department, or the highway patrol. Um, and out of that, let me see if I can find my numbers here. There were 684 statewide drug evaluations in 2019. Wildlife officers did 77 of those. So yes, I feel we are having a great impact on that side of it. And as you can see in 2020, our numbers were down a little bit, but they were down for a lot of folks in 2020 due to the COVID outbreak. Um, in 2019, the uh, North Carolina DRE Officer of the Year Award was presented to a wildlife officer. That was the second time that that had ever happened uh, since DRE program started in North Carolina. Uh, and then again, our telecommunications dispatches for the DRE program. When an officer encounters someone and they're impaired on something other than alcohol, they need a DRE to do an evaluation. They contact our communication center, a text and an email is sent out immediately to a 50 mile radius of that location to every certified DRE so that they are notified and can get in contact with that officer and get what they need. And again, bottom bullet point I've already talked about once, but most of these are conducted by wildlife officers are for other agencies. They are not for the Wildlife Commission. Before we get to that one, um, I want to talk about two other things real quick. And this, we can always use help, but these are some concerns we've run into, is underage drinking right now. We are running into that more and more. And I guess it's the setting we are in as a law enforcement division, uh, whether it's these remote areas or on the boat. We stop a boat, 15 people on it, 10 of them's underage, and they're all consuming alcohol. So that is a great concern for us. But another concern we have with that is the raise the age legislation that went into effect. And some of you are familiar with it, some may not be, but the 16, 17 year olds cannot be charged by officers with that now. They have to be prosecuted through juvenile court. And unfortunately, what we're finding is juvenile court is just bombarded with cases. Unfortunately, they talk to them and they, they cut them loose, send them on their way, um, and that's the end of it. I personally know of three people that were encountered 16 or 17 years old this past summer that was not only consuming alcohol, they were actually impaired at adult levels. And guess what happened to those? They got counseled and turned loose. So yeah, this is this is a big problem for us. Um, we're seeing it more and more. Um, we would like to see some of this changed. Chapter 20 laws can be uh, charged, even 16, 17 year olds, but not many other things can be in adult court. They have to go through the juvenile process. And we know that that, that process it's so slow because it is so full, full of people trying to get what they need. The other thing is littering. Wildlife officers contact a lot of littering cases. Just to give you a few numbers, 2019 wildlife officers across the state charged 276 littering cases, 2020, 293 cases. So that is something we also are very proactive in. This is a photograph of the officer in Robinson County. This is uh, Miles Sampson. Uh, he lives there in the county, a uh, very fine young man, hardworking officer that we have there. If you ever need to contact him, there is his state cell phone number, and below that is his sergeant, Eric Clark. He actually lives in Hope County, but he supervises Robinson, Hope, and Scotland County. If you ever need anything from those folks, don't hesitate to give them a call. Again, that's their state cell phone. They have it on all the time. So I hope that sort of ties it together for you but um, and, and puts it together with, with the Vision Zero principles. If you have any questions, please ask. Don't hesitate to ask us. Mr. Allen. Yes. I'm Shane Todd. I'm with the um, Friends of Test for Alcohol and the back coordinator in, the, in this yes. area. Region. Um, you know, we're talking about BWIs, and I do a lot of them towards Stanley County and Montgomery County. Um, I, I do tons of them up that way. Um, last year, I did one in Columbus and one in Brunswick at the same day. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been trying to, you know, push pretty hard to maybe get some some of your guys in this district four area to start doing it because you know like the lumber river you know there's been yes. some incident there uh is there any way maybe you could see that we could get together one day and maybe get a few of these things started because i think it will make a big impact on the community 
and, and people seeing what we do, you know. And well, you know, the bus just setting out bus just setting out one of those uh, locations is just a, enough as as a principle as itself because everybody in this county is familiar with the lose it lose it bus, you know. Yes, they are. They are. They are absolutely. And we are pushing very hard for our officers to get more involved with the bat program. Uh, central part of the state and the very far east is more uh, involved than most, but we are trying to spread it spread that throughout the state and, and get a little more consistency so yes that would be a great thing well if you if you can reach out to those guys i mean i'm i'm, I'm willing and available i'm open to anything uh i'm off i know they like to do a lot of sunday activity i'm off on just about every sunday i'll take any time i can do i mean i'm willing to go as far as i can go do whatever i got to do i just need to okay. make the contact and get, get your guys involved absolutely i can make that happen well sir i appreciate it yes sir any other questions for Lieutenant Carlisle? Lieutenant Carlisle, thank you for uh, tying it together. And it definitely, uh, it definitely has a tie into our Vision Zero because whether you're uh, impaired on the water or on the highways, the results all end up the same. It's most of the time just tragic for us. So uh, thanks for that uh, presentation. Yes, and sir. I'll, thank uh, you. And I'll echo uh, your comments about Miles Sampson. Miles is uh, good, good people. So glad to have Miles here in Robinson County. Our next presenter is uh, David Harris. Uh, David's with the Roadside Environmental Unit with the department. Uh, David, uh, littering is 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 a terrible issue here in the county, but there's been some Herculean efforts made by uh, the county commissioners, the uh, the sheriff's department, uh, the sheriff trying to uh, make inroads into our littering issue. Uh, there's nothing probably uglier to me than than just a nasty roadside. And uh, so, uh, looking forward to your presentation. Uh, All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. I do appreciate it. Uh, thank you for letting me give this opportunity to, to get some information out to y'all and uh, say thank you to those that are working so diligently to improve the condition of our roadsides. Uh, one thing that uh, we want to talk about is how does this relate to Vision Zero in Robeson County and other counties? Well, part of the Department of Transportation's goal is to provide a very safe uh, good highway system for travelers to travel and that means you have basically good road surfaces safe guardrails good signs for visibility and a clear recovery zone uh, so in the event that you do have to leave the road uh, you do have a safe place to recover that vehicle without impacting something uh, give a little bit of history of, of where we are how did we get here uh, that's a question that i get all over the state uh, I'd like to go back and, and talk a little bit about North Carolina and, and give a little bit bigger and broader view of it. Uh, North Carolina DOT is one of the few departments in this nation that looks after all of its roads. That's 80,000 miles of roads, second largest in the nation, uh, 15,000 miles of primary and 65,000 miles of secondary. So it, it's a big system. And, and the section that we're focused on is the roadside management system, and, and that is vegetation management, litter management, our rest areas, the aesthetics of our highways, environmental protection, and, and stormwater management. That's where these areas take place. And aesthetics is one of those things that gets everybody's attention. It's why tourists come to North Carolina. It's, it's the roadsides, they are the front yards of, of North Carolina. This is what the first thing people see when they get off an airplane. And uh, so not only is it a safe environment, it's there for you to recover a vehicle, it's also an aesthetic thing. Uh, so what happened was in, in 20, 2017, legislature looked at roadsides, and, and we've struggled with this, not just recently, we've struggled with it since, since the 60s, 50s, as long as people have been throwing out trash, uh, this condition exists. But uh, in 2018, legislature said, let's get things cleaned up. and they they targeted some monies to specifically focus on these issues. And uh, we improved our visibility and we, we went out there and started looking at um, 
how we can control our vegetation, increase site distances, pick up litter. We were successful. 2018-2019, uh, we saw uh, some of the best results in the state. Uh, the divisions were able to do the work. Um, our complaints were at an all-time low. And um, aesthetically, uh, we were looking good. And I think we were doing our, our part to maintain a safe recovery zone. But unfortunately, as we all know, and especially in y'all's area, these hurricanes come up along the coast and just wreak havoc on our whole state and uh, does damage to not only the highway system, but to homes and businesses. Um, it creeps up and, and it got into the mountains, caused massive landslides. When, when this happens, the only thing we have to fall back on is our maintenance funds. And when the division, you know, Drew has to look at his budgets, he has to target what's his priorities. And when we're spending money to open roads and fix things, uh, he has to prioritize stuff. And so uh, we were trying to get through the storms when COVID hit, and that even set us back even further. Um, people stopped driving, and when people stopped driving, you saw a massive decrease in, in forecasted revenue. I mean, some of the forecasters were talking about six to seven hundred million dollars, a shortfall, a shortfall in revenue. So uh, the managers of DOT had to make some harsh decisions and uh, had to look at what we could do to uh, pull back. And in, and in likely fashion, the roadside area is one of those areas that you pull back on because we need to keep our bridges safe. We need to keep our traffic signals safe. Um, road surfaces need to be safe. Striping needs to be safe. So uh, management had to make those decisions and, and rightfully so. And as you can see here, uh, these are statewide numbers to our physical year. This is how many pounds of litter we picked up in the 2019 year. That's over 10 and a half million pounds of litter was picked up. That's litter that was supposed to be in the landfills. Uh, 10 and a half million pounds. And uh, that was not all of it. That was doing the best we could at that time. And that year we, we spent about 19 to 20 million dollars in uh, picking up litter. And you can see that it dropped off dramatically in 2020. And you, you, people ask, well, why is there so much more litter out there? Well, there's four and a half more pounds, four, four million pounds that did not get picked up. Um, did we put it there? No, no, DOT did not put it there. And uh, DOT would like not to have to pick it up. We would like for everyone to keep their trash in their vehicles and not throw it out. And then we could spend that 20 million fixing your bridges installing some of those four-way stops uh, that Mr. Hunt likes so much and doing some improvements that improve safety that uh, prevents these accidents that we're working so hard to stop. But uh, this is the reality of our society. Um, the secretary and the board of transportation, the governor, everybody said, let's, let's get things back. And uh, we start seeing increased revenues of society, of the economy, everything started rebounding. And uh, secretary and the board uh, reprioritized some money and the divisions went to work. And uh, as you can see, starting from January 1, uh, we're, we're doing well. We're approaching two and a half million pounds uh, when I looked at the numbers uh, today. So uh, we continue to track this positive trend. And uh, it, it's all because people want to see our state good. They want to see our state clean. And um, Let's just look at Division Six and look at uh, the difference in what we did. And I think you saw Drew and his staff was able to pick it up in 2020 and, and try to go out there and focus on the areas that they could. But it's definitely uh, an impact that shows on the highways. Uh, here's, a, here's a more telling number of, of the different counties and what was able to pick up. You can see Rubs County is right up there, a lot of effort down there. And, and I think Drew and them have a good plan to, to tackle the problems that y'all were seeing there today. Uh, special thanks, uh, you know, this, this effort by, uh, this, by the sheriff and the volunteer fire departments, uh, just to give y'all some background information, they picked up over 1,500 bags of trash and over 200 tires in just this one effort. So that, that, is, that is unbelievable. First of all, it's unbelievable that, that much trash was put out there. I don't know what people are doing with their tires, but uh, uh, 
uh, that, that's that's unbelievable how many tires people are throwing out. So these type of efforts uh, are, are quintessential to us being successful. But we also get questions about, are you educating people? Are you letting people know? Well, we have uh, a whole new media uh, output that's that's getting ready, to, getting ready to roll out. And I can't give you many details because I, I do think some of the uh, people they've got lined up to give public service announcements announcements is pretty exciting but you should should hear more about that in coming weeks but we get uh, information to our schools to our teachers we have teacher packs that the teachers can get and uh, so so we, we do our best to get this educational information out there some of the areas people are always asking is where can I help um, public awareness that that's one of the biggest things uh, we continue to look for ways to get people's attention of course, media is going to be one way, but people volunteering for our Adopt a Highway program. And if you're part of any company or corporation that's wanting to do your part, um, we have a sponsor a highway program. And uh, this program allows corporate uh, America to get involved uh, with our Adopt a Highway groups for over 455 active groups across the state. Uh, you can go to, if you want to get involved, you can go to our website, and search up NCDOT Adopt a Highway, and uh, you can go in and drill into our map, and you can see if your road's been adopted. And uh, if it's not, if it has been adopted and a group's not picking up, we'd like to know about it. Uh, you're required to pick up four times a year, so uh, no, they do, have, do not have to go out there every day or every month and pick up just four times. And uh, they work with the counties to, uh, each county has a has a coordinator that they work with to make sure they have the proper equipment, safety stuff. Uh, we want to make sure everyone stays safe when they're out there. None of this is worth anyone losing their life over. Um, the Sponsor Highway uh, program has been very successful. Uh, 655 miles have been sponsored by Corporate America and Johnson Automotive currently is our, our best sponsor with over 530 miles. You know, Mr. Johnson said, uh, if I could spend my money on advertising, I would rather spend it doing something good. So we're trying to uh, encourage the rest of corporate America to get out there and look for ways to get their recognition and uh, advertising dollars to, to do something good. Uh, there's a map you can kind of see where uh, these routes are uh, sponsored by the uh, Sponsor Highway Program. So we have all of I-95 uh, sitting there and 74, so there's a lot of lot of opportunities to grow this program. Uh, dig in a little bit deeper on the Adopt a Highway program. If you do have questions, uh, we have a way to go in there and and uh, register a section of road and, and get your group out there. We do ask that if anyone does pick up litter, we want them to report that litter. Um, that litter report is then used to generate the data that you've seen earlier in this presentation, and we have to generate a report to submit to the legislature every year showing our, our progress. Um, if you want to get involved, there's other ways. Uh, the litter sweep, which is our big two-year annual event uh, coming up uh, in the spring here, April 10th through the 24th, and this is where uh, if you don't belong to Adopt a Highway Group, but you want to go out there and pick up some, uh, go to Google that on our website. You'll find the information for Litter Suite, and you can work with your county uh, DOT office and let them know where you're wanting to pick up, and they can help you. If uh, you know, if let's say you pick a road and they feel like it's too too unsafe for you to be out there, they're going to advise you of that. And we're going to try to try to keep everyone in a safe environment. We did get questions about what happened last year. Well, we canceled our events last year because this time last year, let's face it, I don't think anybody knew what we were facing. And we didn't know if people could go out there and, and, be, and be safe because we didn't really understand the dynamic that we were facing. Um, I feel like today uh, as society, we're, we're a little bit better knowledgeable of what COVID is and how to operate and keep ourselves safe, wearing masks, staying uh, six feet apart. So uh, we decided to go ahead and push forward with the uh, litter sweep this year, and there'll be one in September. So please look for that as well. And um, uh, we can't say enough, we can't thank the groups enough that go out there, the people that are dedicated to keep this up. We get a lot of complaints. A lot of people are mad, angry. One, one complaint we do get a lot is what happened to the prisoners. Why, why are the prisoners not out there? Well, 
back in the day, there, there was a prison yard in every county. And, uh, you know, prisoners were, were taken out there on those roadsides and done and did the work that they needed to do. And it was a good program. But over time, uh, those prisons consolidated. They adjusted. They had to move. They they made larger prisons. And these some of these prisons are geographically not located in the places where the litter is. And the department was, was spending about $9.2 million paying the prison system to go out there and pick up litter. Well, uh, population grew. Uh, there was restrictions on where they could operate safely with prisoners. And uh, the, the footprint got smaller and smaller. And so the department just didn't feel like that this was the best system. So the legislature allowed us to, to reprioritize that money, but it did open up some opportunities. Uh, Robeson County is a good example. The Sheriff uh, Wilkins has got involved and uh, we're using the uh, community service people, the people that's got to do their community service to go out there and pick up litter. Now, I would rather have someone out there picking up litter next to my child's school uh, that, that has some community service hours to give versus uh, a hardened criminal or someone who's uh, doing a little bit worse time for uh, a crime they committed. So we're encouraging this program and uh, Robeson is a great example of, of that program working. So um, again, can't say enough to the sheriff's offices that are getting those people out there to do that work. Um, it, it is a, a, a unique situation. Um, it is one that I, I would like to see resolved. I think it's going to take an effort of uh, continuous media awareness. It's going to take uh, some new technology. We've been asked about camera systems. Um, we've not been successful at a camera being able to take a picture of a car, get the pictures, uh, picture of the person's face and license plate and them throwing trash out such that uh, law enforcement can prosecute that individual. So I think it's going to take some new technologies and uh, Hopefully we'll be able to find a solution to this, but uh, the easiest solution is for people to secure their loads and uh, don't throw that out the trash. Um, and that that's all I have. Uh, any questions, please let me know. This is Jessica Horn from the Robosonian. I want to double check those numbers you said. Were those pounds of trash that you were talking about? Yes. Okay, thank you, sir. David, this is Cheryl Leonard with the Governor's Highway Safety Program. Is there a uh, link or somewhere we can identify uh, who we need to connect with in each of our counties and particularly in uh, Robeson County? Yeah, I think if you go in, if you Google the uh, NCDOT litter management system, uh, you're going to be taken right to the, the different programs and that's going to feed you down to the coordinator and that coordinator in your area will be able to uh, direct you to who you need to talk with. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, and David. I will say one thing I would like to add. Uh, the information you see on this one slide is to the calendar year. And uh, for most people, we they deal with the calendar year. And uh, uh, this slide here um, is, this first one here is to the physical year. That's the, that's the year that DOT talks about. And that goes from July 1 to June 30th. So for the physical year of 2021, which is a little confusing, for statewide effort, we've picked up five and a half million pounds. But uh, since most people like to deal with just calendar year, uh, this is where we are in the calendar year, at least in division six. Thanks, David. Thanks for the presentation. And I can tell you, uh, you know, we all know our roads are our front yard and uh, I can tell you there's been a lot more discussion about uh, litter on our roadside at the uh, board level in the last uh, few months uh, because all of us are hearing the same complaints. Uh, whether I'm here, whether it's out in the western part of the state, the northern part of the state, we're all hearing the same complaints. Folks are really complaining about the litter on the roadside. So. Uh, we're definitely discussing it at the board level and hopefully uh, we'll have, like you said, with new interventions uh, because, uh, you know, what we're, what we have is just not enough. Uh, it, yeah. it seems to me like we need more. So uh, thank you for that presentation. 
and, and thank you, Drew. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Alan. Uh, appreciate everybody's efforts today. Um, on our agenda, we've got our meetings for May, August, and October. So set your calendars, but I'll always uh, send out a notice. But appreciate everybody's participation today. And uh, any, if there's not any questions, uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn our meeting. Grady, um, could I mention, this is Cheryl with Governor's Highway Safety. I wanted to mention one thing, um, kind of tagging along with um, uh, Director Ezell's presentation about the seatbelt program. We have a Saved by the Belt program as well in North Carolina under Governor's Highway Safety, where we um, encourage individuals who have uh, who wear their seatbelt and who have been successfully saved by wearing their seatbelt and would like to tell their story. And we have a link that we can send to the participants on this um, webinar and on our task force so that they can help us get the word out. Uh, it's just a, a short form to fill out so that we can connect with individuals that have been successful in surviving by wearing their seatbelt. And we um, would like to place them on uh, some of our social media platforms. And they also uh, would receive a certificate uh, signed by our director uh, for the success of that. And so if um, anyone has any ideas or thoughts, please let me know. And we'll also be sending out that link so that people can uh, connect. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. If there's nothing else, uh, see you guys in May.